several different types of emails from LinkedIn. You'll get folks wanting to make connections with you. And the one cool thing as far as structure goes, um, when you're making Facebook, you have friends. Twitter, you have you know friends and connections and that kind of thing. On LinkedIn, I'm going to write real fast. You have what, you, what they call connections. And these connections, inside of your connections, if you have 50 of them, down to 50, that's your network. Okay? That's, on LinkedIn, they call that your, your personal network. Again, I'm writing real fast. Sorry. Um, but also what LinkedIn does for you is they have second, second, third, and fourth, and I think it goes to fifth generation networks also. So you have this person, number 35 right here, also has a network of connections. So now these folks out here are in your second generation network, your network. You don't know them. Normally, you won't know them or not have ever met them and may not ever have met them. But when you start interacting in groups and you start interacting um, or accepting friend requests or putting up your profiles or maybe putting ads on Facebook or, or on LinkedIn or start talking about some things that interest you or um, interest rates going up and down, that kind of thing, there's actually places in LinkedIn where you get identified to this person's 35th connection that you have no idea who they are. But when they see you talking about something on LinkedIn, they know that you're a second generation friend, so they trust you a little bit more because you're a friend of a friend. And it does the same thing, my marker's running out here. It does the same thing all the way out to the fifth generation. So what that does is kind of build a trust bubble. So it's not like going into Twitter and you might see some account on Twitter and you don't even know if it's a real person or not. And maybe some guy sitting in his mom's garage in Vietnam or something with Sally as their name. You just don't know who they are. But in LinkedIn, these are trusted connections and they actually monitor these. They'll have accounts deleted, they'll put people on probation if there's inappropriate material or if you start abusing friends and friend requests and that kind of thing, back to the email you were talking about. Um, if you get just something that looks totally odd, there's an abuse button on there and they will actually investigate them. So back to directly answer your question, when you get those emails, you should always have something that says you want to accept them as a friend or connection, sorry, accept them or decline them. And you can even postpone it if you want to. And you can even carry on a private conversation with them like, who are you? What do you do? You know, or you can click on them and go see their profile. And maybe at some point, you may want to connect to them. Because it, when you go and click on their profile, and we're going to see that in a few minutes, when you go click on this friend's friend's con connections profile, you're going to actually see places where you guys overlap. Maybe you're in a couple of groups that they're in, and you're like, oh, wow, OK, well, maybe I may need to use them at some point as a business partner. So you may want to actually friend them. That's really a long answer for accept most of them, accept most of them as connections as long as they lo don't look like they're that guy in Vietnam. Sally. And, right, exactly, <laughs> Sally, or whatever the commercial is. I can't remember the health support commercial. Yeah. Um, because you never know when they're going to help you. Also, the good thing about it, when you log into Facebook and you have that long timeline, if you friended a whole bunch of people on Facebook and Twitter that you don't really know, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to filter through all that information. You normally don't have that problem on LinkedIn. There are places where you can go and see full updates. That's what LinkedIn calls these timelines, full, see full updates. But that's not normally your home page of your LinkedIn page. So, it usually doesn't cloud you up if you get a lot of friends. Um, I have almost a thousand connections on LinkedIn, on my personal um, LinkedIn account. And we'll, we're going to go through mine in a second. But I don't even pretend to know all these people. But there are people that are indirectly that I've run across, their friends of friends of friends over time. And they see me talking about things and hop in the groups that I'm in, or the same thing, vice versa, when I jump in, I may see something that's interesting and I'll hop in there. So um, don't always think you have to be a friend with someone to connect with them on LinkedIn. You never know where they're going to be able to benefit you or you benefit them down the road. Okay? Any other questions? Feel free to speak up.
to me it doesn't make sense. If I if yeah. I have my clients on the page and yes. people that are my prospects on my chat or on my LinkedIn, right. and then another realtor wants to be on my LinkedIn, am, am I not putting them directly in touch with my clients and prospects? That is a possibility. We're going to talk in a second about knowing your demographics and knowing your social graphics. That's a new term that some of you might not know yet. We all know what demographics are. I mean, that's sales 101. We learned that way back when. Um, social graphics is identifying your consumers, your potential customers, and where they actually hang out online. So understanding the social graphic profile of the folks that you're going to friend with, whether they're realtors or whether they're potential clients, you need to make a personal decision yourself on if you're going to mix those worlds together. Um, we take on and... Cameron and I work in the same office. He's our brand manager at Jace. Cameron and I work in the same office, and we have a policy in our office that we friend everybody. There's, for us, in our industry, there's plenty of fish for everyone in the sea. Um, so we don't worry as much about competitors and someone stealing our clients and that kind of thing. By the way, turn your phones back on. It's okay. Answer your text messages. Talk on Twitter. It's okay. I don't, I don't worry about that. Um, where was that? Sorry. <laughs> um, but the poli setting those policies are totally up to you. If you don't feel comfortable with that, and if most of the conversations you're going to have on LinkedIn or on Facebook or on your blog or anywhere else on the Internet, if most of your conversations are going to be towards your potential clients, then keep it that way. Um, I think especially in the real estate industry in Hampton Roads, and I go and talk to a whole lot of people in, on the East Coast and across the United States, and even in educational institutions. And I always have to go back to, um, you need to identify that for yourself. You have to understand that you have to make up your mind and just be consistent with how you're gonna do it across your whole social media platforms, all, all of them. Um, but I think you, you have, there's a disclaimer there that you can't think as old school because there's a benefit to knowing people in your industry. So you can't totally shut that out. Totally. So, but I don't have a right and wrong answer for that. And, I don't th and if anybody ever told you there's a right and wrong answer, just like with most questions about social media, they're wrong. There's not ever a right and wrong answer because social media is so new and so malleable and changes so much that it's really a lot of trial and error to see what works for you and see what works for you in your business and your geographic area. Yeah.